Thank you all for taking the time to join this inaugural session of the Wiser Wisdom Series. It's so great to have so many people from around the world attend this event. In these challenging times, platforms for education and knowledge sharing have never been more important. And WISER, which stands for Women in Sustainability, Environment and Renewable Energy, is a platform that brings together industry professionals, thought leaders, community members, and young people all committed to achieving our mission of educating and empowering women to sustainability. To kick off our Wiser Wisdom Series today, we will be looking at the role that women can play in the sustainable recovery from COVID-19. And I am pleased to welcome Michael Lebrecht, Chairman and CEO of Lebrecht Associates and the Wiser Advisory Council member. Michael is globally renowned for his expertise in the fields of clean energy, transportation, sustainable development, and smart infrastructure. He's, a so, he's also a senior contributor at Bloomberg <laughs> New Energy Finance, which he founded in 2004. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. It's a huge pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Zeno. Um, Michael, before we start our conversation, um, let's ask our audience for their thoughts on today's topic with a quick poll. Can you all please read the questions on the screen? and vote using the bottom on the right. It's the one with three lines, and you have one minute to answer. Thank you all. Uh, so interesting. 79%, almost everyone who's attending today's session, Michael, think yes, the pandemic has accelerated the clean energy transition. And um, COVID-19, Michael, seems to have been with us forever. So can you remind us what was happening in the energy and transport and climate space before the pandemic? Yes, certainly. Um, and as you say, COVID-19 has you know, really uh, uh, occupied the airwaves and you know, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. But um, I think it's useful to go back and remember what the sort of mega trends were uh, prior to the pandemic, because then we can ask that question that you just asked, will, it, will they accelerate? or will they slow down? So at the end of last year, I wrote a piece for Bloomberg New Energy Finance, New Bloomberg NEF, saying the peak emissions are closer than we think, and here's why. And um, what I took as my starting point was the changes in the last six years of economic activity and CO2 emissions from energy. Well, you have, you know, Greta Thunberg, who does a magnificent job of raising awareness, saying, you know, you adults have done nothing and it's scandalous and it's terrible. So, in fact, in the last six years, there was a 23 percent growth in GDP, in economic activity, and only a 3 percent growth in emissions. So we're really starting to see by the end of 2019 this kind of um, divergence between economic activity and associated emissions. Now, a couple of observations. First of all, um, we need net zero. You know, just flat emissions is not good enough. We need to push them down to zero, and they need to go to zero for one and a half degrees. They need to go by 2050 for two degrees. They would need to go by later in the century. Um, and so clearly, flat emissions is not enough from a climate perspective. But you know, if you're going to have emissions go down to zero, they first got to peak. So it's a very good early indicator if we can get to peak emissions sometime, and I postulated already before COVID 
that it would happen before 2030, so this uh, decade. The other observation is, why is that happening? You know, some people will say, oh, well, that's just because of uh, cheap natural gas in the US, because of fracking. And so you've got coal switches to gas, and obviously that can only go so far. Well, the answer is, it's really, uh, it's really a number of different factors. Of course, natural gas, coal to natural gas is one, but also the structure of economies as we get more development in the world, so there's less investment in really basic things like roads and uh, and uh, and uh, in the early infrastructure, and more uh, economic activity relates to services. So there's a shift, and that's starting to happen in more and more countries, even the slower developing world, not just China, but now in some African countries, we see middle classes and so on. So we see a change in economic mix, making the economy a bit less energy intensive. We also see energy efficiency, which kind of always gives us one or two percent of improvement year in and year out. Uh, and so we do see that LED lights would be one good example, that uh, they've gone from almost zero percent market share to uh, considerable market share, uh, over 50 percent. And then, of course, the one that we all love to talk about, which is renewable energy, where you know we really saw wind and solar at the beginning of that period, 2013, still very small, still, um, you know, you could still just about get away with calling them alternative energy. But, you know, by now, we're talking about wind and solar accounting for the majority of new electricity generating capacity around the world. Um, they generate 11% in 2019, 11% of world electricity was non-hydro renewables. And the line is really curving up quickly. And of course, they've just become really cheap. And you know that in uh, in the Gulf region uh, better than anybody because you've seen these very low costs uh, solar projects under $20 per megawatt hour. We see them in uh, not just the Gulf, but we've seen them in you know, more and more countries around the world and including some very low costs now coming out of Europe, um, which has lagged in the cost stakes. So for all those reasons, actually, we can be and of course, we could talk about transportation um, that we've seen tremendous progress. Now, electric vehicles, of course, most cars we see on the road are still internal combustion. But in lots of countries of the world, we now see sort of five to seven percent of new cars, even at the end of last year, being electric. So we see, again, another curve that's starting to bend upwards uh, in terms of electrification of transport. So um, that was the situation uh, prior to COVID. Very exciting, accelerated uh, a, the transition to cleaner energy and transport accelerating. Um, Michael, having mentioned those observations, in fact, how has COVID-19 impacted these sectors? Well, so clearly the first thing that happened with the lockdown was this dramatic drop in energy demand of all sorts, whether it was electricity, a bit, you know, that dropped a bit less than transport fuels, airline fuels, just across the board, this kind of heart attack of the, to the economy had a dramatic impact. Um, and now we see it coming back and we see it at different speeds. So um, uh, China with its very dramatic lockdown has bounced back uh, more quickly than Europe. Um, which uh, uh, lagged China going in and came out somewhat slower. And now we've got some rising cases. So economic activity is still depressed. And then, of course, the US, where the desire to um, open up quickly was totally counterproductive. And so now we see uh, depressed economic activity persisting for longer in the US. But, you know, that's the first story. The second order story is, well, what has changed about the nature of demand uh, even already? So clearly we've seen um, you know, more use of, uh, of, of uh, online uh, conferences, so um, video conferencing, uh, business travel has switched into much, much more uh, digital communications. But we've also seen things like uh, a switch in cities away from public transport, because people are very scared about getting back on a bus or a train, 
And so they either want to drive or active transport. And uh, we can see already an emerging sort of battle because um, the car owners have been uh, you know, pushed out of the frame, active travel, cycling, walking has had a, an enormous boost during the pandemic. But now, as people are going back to work and they still want to park in the same place and they want to do the same thing, so they're now starting to push back. And one of the big questions that we'll have is how many of these behaviors are sticky? Will we all rush back to the office five days a week? Will we still want to drive to our doctor's appointments? Will we still um, you know, behave the same ways? And the answer is no. There's going to be some, in, in a sense, if, if, if the first order was the heart attack, the second order was the recovery, near term, the third order impacts are going to be the stickinesses. And there will be some. You know, big companies are now deciding that they don't need their people all to go into the office five days a week. And they're actually reevaluating how much office space they need. Um, if you've got uh, you know, people who've had to go physically to medical appointments, home medicine has developed enormously in the last six months in its sophistication and what, we're, what we accept. And you will never go to a doctor for a repeat prescription ever again. That, was, that would just be crazy. Whereas last year, that was a very normal thing to do. Um, you know, it remains to be seen in sectors like um, education, you know, homeschooling, of course, sort of took, you know, we all had to do it for our kids, but that was not so popular. So probably though, there we will see much more of a return to the kind of prior status quo, uh, in, you know, not 100 percent. But, you know, so we need to see these trends evolving. Um, but they reinforce the transitions because the more you use digital controls, the more you're using uh, a media enhanced experience to your in-person experiences. Um, then the quicker we're going to get a shift to clean energy. And just finally on that, very specifically in the energy sector, what we saw as energy demand plummeted, we saw the renewable energy holding up much better, not just in uh, volume of energy, but also in investment, right? Um, and you know that's partly because uh, a bunch of older, maybe coal-fired plants were shut down because they were just not needed. And rather than mothball them, the owners said, well, you know, this might be quite a good time to shut them. We might get some uh, support from the government or not, but they, they've been forced off the system. You know, don't forget that renewable energy, particularly wind and solar, um, has and hydro has no variable cost. There's no fuel cost. So um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a situation where demand is suppressed, those resources will tend to remain on whilst gas, coal, oil, diesel will be shut down because there you've got to keep buying the fuel. So you choose the free one rather than or the one that's free at the, at the variable cost level. Um, and of course, um, you know, the investment has held up because when oil price cr crashes to negative or to $40 or $30, that has led to real soul searching in the oil and gas sector. Whereas the logic of renewables has really not changed that much. And we've got maybe slightly lower energy prices on the electricity side, but much uh, it's obvious we're going to get a lot of cheap debt during the recovery. So I think my answer to that question that you posed, that you, that you, the, the poll question, I would be with the 79 percent saying absolutely, despite the short term heart attack of the pandemic and what it did to the economy, it will act as a quite substantial accelerator of the shift to clean energy and transportation. Okay, so some encouraging signs of resilience here, but it's really clear that we still have a long way to go to achieve a truly sustainable recovery. Michael, can you tell us what you think that sustainable recovery will look like and how can we achieve it or what are the actions we need to do what are the actions needed to be taken to doing so? We are we are absolutely only at the beginning of this story. And, you know, the great financial crisis really took a decade uh, to recover. So uh, we had to rebuild balance sheets in the wake of the great financial crisis. And that took a decade. And balance sheets have taken a, a, a probably a similar hit, maybe even worse. I mean, we just don't know to what extent there'll be. You know, I think the recovery will be a bit of a V but then a long, long climb back to where we were before. And um, everybody's balance sheet has been hit. 
Um, my personal balance sheet, everybody's balance you know, no violins for me particularly, but you know, individuals' balance sheets, corporate balance sheets, governments, national balance sheets, the banking sector, we don't know. And so um, you know, that, that we, it's very early to say what a recovery uh, looks like. We are, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Now, the most important thing though, what we don't want is what we saw in the recovery for the great financial crisis was a lot of money poured into essentially fossil fueled parts of the economy. So back in 2008 to nine, we saw emissions drop by one and a half percent, but 2009, 10, they jumped by 5%, right? That would be disastrous. You know, we've seen the emissions this year will drop actually by much more, probably by 8%, some six to 8%, right? Now the question is, do they bounce back um, 2%, 5%, 8%, or 12%. I mean, clearly, we would like to see it bounce back. Uh, emission, you know, the economy bounce back, well-being bounce back, but not the emissions. Now, there will be some bounce back. I, I think that's inevitable. Um, but what we've got to do is to make sure that the stimulus and the recovery activity um, supports the climate transition, that it doesn't act against it. And the IEA has published a sustainable recovery plan to try to help governments think that through. My own favorite contender in that race is actually energy efficiency. And why? Because some of the other things, it's not, I, I don't have anything against, somebody wants to spend money on hydrogen or, 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 or giga solar projects, you know, out in the empty quarter or wherever you're gonna put them and so on, that's all fine, right? The problem is it doesn't put a lot of people to work quickly in the way that energy efficiency does. If you spend money on energy efficiency, it goes to builders, it goes to plumbers, it goes to electricians. It doesn't just go to a few lawyers and engineers for the next two, three years. It goes straight to uh, people. Now, interestingly and very important, we can talk about this maybe in the Q&A, energy efficiency, because of the nature of the trades, it may be uh, negative for the gender agenda, right? Because most electricians and plumbers and builders are men, not women. But nevertheless, setting that aside, maybe coming back to it, it puts money into the pockets of people who are very financially stressed, who've maybe had two, three, four, six months with no work. So it's a good multiplier, short term. Long term, it improves our asset base. And so it reduces uh, the drag on the economy of high energy costs. So it's a good long term multiplier. And it's good for the climate. And in fact, if we don't deal with energy efficiency, we can forget getting to net zero in any accelerated time frame and dealing with the climate challenge. So that would be my number one contender. I call energy efficiency the Swiss army knife of the stimulus programs. Uh, but anything distributed, electric vehicle charging, uh, rooftop solar, uh, batteries in the home, anything that's distributed over a large proportion of the population will employ a lot of people, get the economy going, put money into pockets, and is therefore uh, has to be high up in the priorities. Of course, Michael, one of the key challenges to achieving a sustainable recovery is securing the levels of investment required. And as the founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance, what do you see as the key trends in sustainable financing? Well, that's a fantastic question because I have been tracking it now for some you know, 15 years, the flows of money. And um, initially, over the first, let's call it seven years of that period, we can divide it into two, really what was happening was it was specialist money that was flowing. It was people who were maybe, uh, whether they were taking a sort of sacrifice on the returns or not wasn't so much the issue. The issue was that they had specialist skills. They understood solar, they understood wind, they understood clean technologies. We had the boom bust of clean tech, uh, which of course, you know, wiped out a lot of the technology investors in, in that space. But it was, um, it was not the generality of the capital markets that was investing in that space. And in fact, um, around that sort of midway point, about seven or eight years ago, I wrote a piece um, with the World Economic Forum uh, about the barriers to mainstream finance flowing. And I wanted to call it jacuzzi after the famous tract uh, in, in France um, at the end of the uh, 19th century. 
accusing the political system of being institutionally, actually in that case it was anti-Semitic, but I wanted to accuse the financial system to bring, bring out the, um, to the fore the issue of being anti-clean energy. I called them institutionally fossilist because there were things like the um, rules on liquidity, which said, oh no, you can't invest in a, you could invest in real estate, but not in a wind farm. Well, why? Those are both real assets that, that have an offtake agreement and so on. Um, the fiduciary duty for pension funds, the banking reserve ratios, the, there were all sorts of ways in which um, the system was biased against the transition. Well, those have been addressed. So now I would say that it's a level playing field. Um, it may even be tilting towards where the appreciation, and by the way, the, the, the key word here is risk, right? Because I can't tell you seven, 10 years ago, how many people I spoke to um, that said, well, I would love to invest in wind farms or solar farms or clean energy technologies, batteries, whatever, but I can't because they're too risky. We don't know the policy environment. We don't know the prices the, 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 that they will command. We, we don't have certainty. And so we can't invest in much, much too risky. Well, those people, if I, I wish I had a list of the people who told me that, and I wish I could go back and ask them that how risky the investments that they made in oil, gas and coal and associated industries, how risky did those investments turn out to be? Because I was trying to tell them, no, you know, the, the risk is all on the side of conventional at this point. Well, as I say, nowadays, I think that that risk is much better uh, understood. Obviously, work from, um, you know, Mike Bloomberg, Mark Carney, the TCFD, the principles of responsible investing, and literally probably a hundred other initiatives to educate investors the European, the EU taxonomy on clean finance, et cetera, et cetera. It's getting to the point where now the playing field is tilted towards clean investment, towards sustainable investment. So two investments that have the same cash flows, if one was dependent on continuing the fossil model and one was based on uh, transitioning more to a clean model, you'd probably choose the latter. Whereas before, you'd have chosen the former. So we're talking about large amounts of money. There's now something like $16 trillion that is um, chasing after kind of climate compatible, science-based or other targets that are in line with Paris. But we've still got a long way to go because there's still over $200 trillion that is sort of thinking about it, trying to work it out. Well, some of it is thinking about it. Some of it really couldn't care at all. You know, we might have some some players who really don't give it, you know, they're really not putting any weight on it at all. Um, but a lot of that next wave, I think, is going to slide down towards, you know, the ESG, maybe not actual ESG investing, but they will understand that ESG is actually about risk management. And that's something also that the pandemic has shown. Um, ESG funds outperformed. Why? Because they have done all this work historically about risk, about resilience, about governance, about transparency, about early warnings and so on. And their managements were basically just more attuned to the risks that we saw during the pandemic period. So ESG has outperformed. And you know, at the end of the day, if something outperforms the way the capital markets work, everybody will want to at least understand it and probably copy it. Very insightful, Michael, actually. And um, um, now I would like to ask our audience for another um, question and another poll. Um, again, you will see a question presented on the screen. Once again, please use the button on the right to vote. And you have one minute to finish.
10 seconds left. Okay, thank you all. So, um, again, very interesting because um, almost every one attending this session believes, like we have 92% of the people who believe that or our audience does see opportunities in these sectors. What do you think, uh, Michael? What are your thoughts on, on that? And how do you see women entrepreneurs contributing to a sustainable recovery yet beyond and, and beyond? Well, so first of all, I'm astonished that it's not 100%, um, given you know, the audience that we've got and given the amazing work of, uh, of, of Wiser and Mazda over the years and, and so on. So uh, I'd love to, I need, I want to know the names of the people who disagree because um, you know, I, I, maybe they need more, more, more mentoring, more doors opening or something, but they need to understand that absolutely, and of course, there are opportunities uh, for women entrepreneurs. I think, um, you know, let, let's take this in a, few, in a few stages. So first of all, if you go back to the conventional energy industry, um, you can sort of understand why there might be a, um, a bias against women uh, you know, why you, you might say, well, maybe women would be better off as entrepreneurs in healthcare rather than energy, because a lot of that, you know, was uh, in remote locations. It may have been very physically hard. It may have been in risky countries uh, or risky locations. And um, so, you know, that you could sort of argue. I mean, I, I personally know plenty of women who can absolutely thrive in those environments. And so I'm not even sure those are good arguments. But you can see where historically uh, that came from. Now, when you go to uh, clean energy, those issues really, uh, uh, you know, this is just a different, um, you know, it's a different world. We're talking about, you know, the even when you talk about a solar farm, the installation is being automated and robotized, right? So now even the installation of a solar farm, large parts of it involve, um, you know, remote vehicles driving around, air conditioned. If, even if you're in the vehicle, it's going to be an air conditioned cab. And there's absolutely no reason why that job can't be done by a woman. Uh, it's not just the job, by the way. It's also that, you know, um, those early jobs, early entry level jobs in oil and gas involved, you know, that's where people built their networks. That's where they learned their skills and they, uh, they, they were mentored and so on. So it's kind of it's very difficult if you can't do the frontline job to then come in and be credible and get the promotions and the opportunities uh, later in the process. So in clean energy, I think that things have. Um, you know, have changed enormously just because of the, the nature of the technology. But of course, digitization, so much more of the value in the modern energy, the, the post-transition energy system is going to be about digital control. It's going to be about software. It's going to be about services. So if you are um, uh, optimizing the location or the management of wind turbines or of um, electric vehicles being charged across your network, and you're doing that using uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. Well, that's that, 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 that's not gendered work in any way, right? So those opportunities are, are, are all um, absolutely open. The other thing is that the range of different um, tech segments of the value chain is is just opening up enormously. So I talked about you know using machine learning to optimize wind farms or uh, charging on an electric vehicle network. But you know the, you if you if you define the, uh, the the energy and the transition sectors, energy transport, smart infrastructure, water. If you define it broadly, then um, you know th there will be opportunities. As an example, maybe it is recruiting engineers with machine learning knowledge to go into the water industry. Well, that's a recruitment business, right? But that absolutely is an entrepreneurship opportunity for women. You don't have to be with the spanner and the wrench at the pipe attaching the water pipes to be an entrepreneur in the water industry or similar things in the energy or transportation industry. So you cast the net uh, widely, they could be legal services, recruitment services, training, cyber protection, software, um, uh, uh, resource management, um, just you know, co companies that help with communications. Um, if we're going to uh, build large pools of demand response capacity, 
Well, that requires a lot of communications, a lot of risk management, a lot of regulatory. Um, there's a lot of lobbying, so there are opportunities for lobbying companies. So, you know, when you draw out that whole value chain and you look at it and you say, well, I actually think it's al it almost becomes a stupid question. Are there opportunities for women entrepreneurs? Because, you know, it's just it's so obvious that the answer is yes, which is why I can't believe that there's anybody who said no. Maybe they miss, maybe they hit the wrong key by mistake. I hope not. <laughs> um, uh, great insights, Michael, really uh, on the sustainability sectors and the role women can play in it. Now, um, I would like to open the floor for the audience uh, for the Q&A. And um, I can see questions written in, uh, in, the, in the chat box, a lot of them actually. So uh, our first question, comes from Maryam Al Amri. Uh, Maryam, please turn on your camera and microphone and ask your question. Hello? Mariam, hello. We, I hear you. Hi. I can see you and hear you. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much for the great insights. Um, my name is Mariam Al Amri. I'm from Abu Dhabi Global Market. Um, uh, we are also we're actually working on uh, sustainable finance initiative as well as the gender equality initiative. So we're touching on both women and sustainability. Um, my question to you is that uh, the, renewable indus uh, the renewables industry is projected to grow despite COVID-19. In your opinion, what are the main reasons for the industry exhibiting this resilience? Thanks for the question, Mariam. And uh, I, um, I'd love to have an update offline about how the, your initiatives are going, because I was actually, I moderated the launch of the Green Finance Center uh, for Abu Dhabi Global Market. So I'd love to know how that's, it sounds like it's going well. Um, the So why is clean energy more resilient um, or why has investment been resilient? And I think it's, you know, in part, as I explained in my uh, opening comments, that demand for clean energy has stood up very well because it has zero marginal cost. And so uh, what's happened is that some of the fossil resources have been forced off the network and the renewables have stayed on. Now, that alone hasn't you know, changed the economics in any uh, the economic balance um, by itself. But if you think about what it does to people's understanding of risk and their understanding of cost of capital. So you're thinking of investing in, uh, in, in gas or there are still people investing in coal, unbelievably. And suddenly you think, hang on a second, the world's economy is fragile. Resilience matters. And when something bad happens, it's the coal or the gas that gets forced off or the uh, diesel or whatever, uh, the fuel gets forced off first. And so preferentially, you become more attracted to the renewable uh, energy part of it. Um, the other thing is that, you know, these are long projects. So um, they're, you know, you wouldn't really expect, uh, I suppose the real question is when the investment that's flowing, you have to be very surgical about it. Are we talking about new investment decisions or are we talking about the continuing construction of projects that have already been financed? Because the latter, you sort of understand, you know, for a few months you stop, but then you figure out how to wear the PPE and you, re, you reschedule your, your jobs to make sure that people can do social distancing, you work with your suppliers and you continue installations. Um, in terms of final investment decisions, they have held up well, um, but I guess there in part, people are saying, well, I can make my decision now because the installation will anyway only be in a year's time uh, when probably we will have got to grips with the, um, you know, with the pandemic. So um, I can't give a more detailed answer than that. I think, you know, it's just a combination of a number of things, understanding of resilience, existing projects coming back and being built, new projects being financed because fundamentally nothing has really changed. And then, in fact, if you believe my thesis about um, COVID accelerating the transition and maybe some of that kind of green uh, stimulus or the, the post-COVID stimulus, 
it's an attractive, you know, it's still an attractive um, sector to invest in. And let me just finish with one other observation. You know, the low fossil fuel prices, cheap gas, cheap oil, um, gets a lot of attention. Oh, you know, what is that doing to investment? And we've seen investment falling off a cliff in those sectors uh, and potentially building up problems for the next price spike. Um, and but low fossil fuel prices also make it differentially more attractive to not use clean. So electric vehicles, you think, well, why go electric? You can have cheap, uh, you know, cheap gasoline and so on. So I think that there's a couple of reasons for caution with that argument. One is that everybody knows a low oil price this year, collapse in investment in oil means an oil price spike. So you don't go and buy the Hummer because you know that in two, three, four, five, six years, you could really be hit with high costs. Um, but also, we're going to be in a decade of low interest rates. That's clear. Same as after the global uh, financial crisis. And when there's low interest rates, the technologies that are all about upfront capex become easier to finance. And that is renewable energy. That is energy efficiency. That is infrastructure. That is, you know, the the um, the cleaner solutions tend to be more sensitive to interest rates. And we're going to have low interest rates. So I, I, I think we can be pretty sure that the money will be there to continue this uh, transition flow. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much Very for the question. Thank you, Michael and Miriam as well. I just, um, I would like to extend a thank you for ADGM uh, for being our principal partner for Wiser as well. Their support is, is uh, continuous and we thank you, Miriam and ADGM as well. Thank you Let's very much. Our question. Um, we have Raghad. Raghad, if you can please uh, ask your question and put your uh, microphone and camera on, please. Yeah, you can see me. Can you hear me? Well, I can, yes, I can see and hear you. Yeah, hello, Michael. Um, my name is Raghad Al Saleh and I am a master's student and research engineer at Khalifa University. Uh, so thank you for your insightful remarks and for taking your time to share your outlook on sustainable energy recovery with us. Um, so my question to you today is, uh, now it is often said that conventional technologies alone will not be enough to achieve the sustainable development goals. So what are some of the more promising alternative technologies that you see being developed right now? Thank you very much. Um, so we've got um i talked about the you know wind and solar non non hydro renewables that curve really sort of uh, going up but you know that's electricity 11 percent of electricity electricity is only 20 percent of final energy use and so um you know you can do the math and that's 11 percent of 20 so it's it's you know it's a couple of percent only of energy use um so you know clearly that curve is going to go. I, I, that curve clearly is going to go to 30, 40 percent. That's what I've already said many times in the past. That by 2040, um, more than a third of electricity globally will be wind and solar, um, and it could go a lot faster. So one of the things we need is um, all of the complementary technologies that help you to manage that. So that's going to be demand response. That's going to be storage. That's going to be high voltage uh, DC um, and by the way, after 2040, it'll continue. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't get to 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of this very cheap uh, renewable, variable renewables, um, just because, you know, because it's so cheap and because I think entrepreneurs like yourself will innovate in the complementary technologies. Um, in terms of transportation, it's pretty clear that um, that's going to help because all short distance transportation, anybody who's doing driving, you know, under 300 miles, if you, unless you ever go over 300 miles, the electric car is just better and it's going to be cheaper and it's going to be smoother and it's going to be you know, just just better. Um, long distance transportation, freight, um, that needs a lot of innovation. Maybe it'll be electric, maybe it'll be hydrogen. Shipping, enormous need, it may, it may go to ammonia. Right. Hydrogen is a bit difficult in a shipping environment, maybe ammonia, but we need solutions. Aviation. I'm pretty sure aviation is going to go to electric, fully electric for very short distance and probably hybrid electric for the longer distance, larger aircraft. It's just the electric motor is better 
but we need enormous innovations to enable that to work. Is it going to be on biofuels, synthetic fuels, hydrogen? What, you know, for the energy density, we need some solution around that. Um, industry. So I am very skeptical about um, hydrogen for the, as I say, for short distance transport. I think that's been game over for some time. But hydrogen in industry, uh, hydrogen for steel, for glass, for ceramics, to you know, to power uh, industrial, um, uh, you know, industrial uh, sectors that are very difficult to decarbonize just with uh, electricity. We're going to need a lot of innovation there. So I'm, I'm very excited about hydrogen. You see these electrolyzer costs coming down very dramatically, uh, but that's a very exciting area of research. And there's going to be kind of, um, I should say, anything digital, anything that digitally controls uh, uh, this infrastructure that goes from analog to digital, from dumb to smart, all of that we need, because the only way of keeping it all working uh, will be um, using digital control. Cyber protection, we need to do a much better job of managing the, re the resilience of everything we do. And there will be a lot of, um, I'm not sure you can call them black swans, maybe they, maybe you can, um, but it might be solid state batteries. It might be um, technologies that can reject heat directly from buildings out to space to reduce the air conditioning load. Um, it could be uh, metallic hydrogen. It could be there's going to be, some, you know, if you really want to do deep science research, there's plenty of really interesting things uh, that you could devote your time to. So right across the value chain from deep quantum physics -y type research, right the way through to digital innovation using, you know, cloud services and machine learning and so on that, you know, that is already becoming a bit more off the peg. And Can I'm going to so mention one other thing. I've just become an advisor to a geothermal company, uh, and that's very exciting. Oh. Not not necessarily the specific company, um, but it's closed loop geothermal. So no fracking, no interaction with the aquifer. Um, it, you don't need to do it only in Indonesia or where there's steam, um, but it's essentially using lower temperature geothermal resources to generate heat and power. And it could be that closed loop geothermal is kind of the third leg so you'll have wind, solar, and closed loop geothermal, and that then gives you a fantastic dispatchable clean resource. And by the way, I'm also going to mention nuclear. I got nothing against nuclear. Got to be safe and got to get the costs down and delivered on time. Thank you for thank you for answering my question. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ragan. Thank you so much for your insightful question, Brian. We have next, uh, um, I think, uh, Dominic. Dominic, if you can please ask your question and have uh, your camera and microphone on, please. Hi, can you see and hear me? Dominic, hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm Dominic. I'm, I'm, from, <laughs> I'm from Catalyst, a Mazda BP initiative, which is a sustainable startup accelerator. Um, I particularly enjoyed your phrase institutionally fossilist and my and your optimism that it's changed. <laughs> um, so my question is that 2020 has been described as the start of a decade of action to achieve the STGs. How will the coming decade be different from that? Thanks very much. It's a great question. And, you know, it's an interesting phrase, institutionally fossilist um, within the oil and gas sector, particularly the European uh, oil and gas companies, they are, um, you know, really thinking hard and, and making these commitments to net zero and starting to allocate uh, a little bit more of their assets towards uh, the clean solutions. Um, I would never accuse anybody within those companies of being institutionally fossilist, but those organizations are, you know, they're going to have to change very considerably if they're going to really uh, embrace clean solutions. They just have, um, you know, different margins, different risk profiles, uh, different costs of capital. Uh, and so I wish you luck, you know, from within that sort of, um, you know, uh, oil and gas uh, environment. And you're working on obviously the within the catalyst, which is the bit that's really pushing the envelope. So I wish you luck um, with, with that. Um, so I think if we look at the, the decade um, going forwards, I, I would like to think that this is a bit like blowing up a balloon, that, you know, the first bit is really, really difficult. But, you know, if you've ever done a, ch a child's party balloon, you, know, it's like you really have to push hard to get that first little bit blowing up. 
And then actually it starts to go much more quickly. And that's because a lot of these technologies, they are sort of substitutions. They, these are logistic curve penetrations of conventional technologies. And you know, I talk about it in I've talked about it in other places as um like like a sneeze. These penetration curves are like a sneeze, right? So naught to one percent is it just takes forever. You know, you sit there and you want the sneeze to come and it doesn't come and there's no sign and you know and then when you go from one to five percent is already much more quickly and you kind of know that the sneeze is going to happen. You can't quite forecast when you get the breakout. Um, and then from five percent through till the you know till 50 percent essentially that's the sneeze where everything happens and it happens really fast and we saw this with coal um coming off the network in the uk we saw it with led light bulbs we saw it with plug-in uh vehicles in scandinavia particularly in uh in norway boom it just goes really really fast from five to fifty and then of course the back end it starts to sort of slow down again is the way it works and i think we've got now in a lot of countries um, and, and there's lots of reasons why it behaves like that. A lot of them are psychological. Some of them are microeconomics. Um, some of it is just to do with you, you can't, um, you know, you need to wait for those complementary technologies that I talked about to exist. You know, if you want to manage um, vast giga farms, giga wind farms, you need the software to do that. And so that everything has to kind of co-evolve. But I think that in many ways, we're at that kind of sneeze point, um, which is, by technology and by uh, country, it, it just very much varies where, where we are. But there's a lot of that going on. And of course, the other thing that happens is the resistance from the incumbents. I mean, go back 10 years, there were coal companies pouring money into casting doubt about climate change, right? They're gone, they don't lobby anymore, they've got no money, they all went bankrupt, right? Now the pandemic has done a similar thing to the unconventional uh, oil and gas sector, particularly in the US. You know, we, we, we're, they are not able to influence the public discourse in the same way now that they did uh, 10 years ago. So it's kind of like there's a number of different accelerants. And that's why I think that if we can get to peak emissions, we'll find it start to get progressively easier over the next 10 years. And I just want to link your question, Dominique, to um, Ragad's question about what are the next technologies? Because what we do need, it, we almost need to be saying, well, you know, we've got the next 10 years sort of in the bag. I mean, whether we can get emissions down by 25 to 50 percent uh, as climate demands, probably not. But at least we know we've got the technologies, the finance is coming. We kind of know how to get over the hump. But really, the, what's all to play for is 2030 to 2040. So the period when all of the, uh, uh, this audience will be in the prime of your careers, that is the critical decade. It's not this coming decade. We can sort of do more of the same, only a bit more so. But make or break will be 2030 to 2040. And there we don't have all the technologies we need. Right. So we need Raghad to come up with some technologies. And then we need those to be, you know, to become bankable, to become scalable. We need the finance. We need some of you to go off and become venture capitalists, uh, you know, launch your own asset management businesses, whatever you need to do so that we're pouring money into the next generation of solutions between 2030 and 2040 as well. Thank you for that very visually descriptive answer, a lot to think about. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Dominic, and uh, very interesting examples, Michael. It's, it's really bring us to a clearer um, uh, image of what, is, what, the, what the situation is about. Um, Michael, we have a lot of questions come in from the audience, more than uh, what we can cover today. So we're going to put you on the spot. We've compiled uh, some of these questions and we want you to uh, answer them. Rapid fire, 20 seconds. Rapid fire, less. okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, go ahead. Okay, let's go. First question. Women in sustainability, three ways they can be more competitive. Okay, so I think women are very competitive. Um, you know, that we don't need three more ways. Um, and particularly in, um, in, in Abu Dhabi, where there are more women uh, studying STEM than men, as I understand that was the case a few years ago, the only place in the world that I know of that. So I think you're perfectly competitive already. I think you should um, all 
you know, invest your time and energy in what Wiser does, network, help each other, and also, by the way, ask for help from men, right? Because uh, I'm going to give you one one way uh, of of, of uh, maybe improving your your networking. Men are um, will sometimes hold back from reaching out to help, you know, earlier career women entrepreneurs or women researchers or whatever they are. And um, there, there are lots of reasons for that. It's just, you know, it's not something that we know how to do. And there are, in some cases, some risks to doing it, right, to be misinterpreted. And so you need to take control of that process, find um, the people that you want to be mentors, be they women or be they men, and ask for help. That wasn't quite rapid fire, but I think it's a very important message for your audience. Okay, our second question, future of biofuels, bright or non-existent? Uh, super bright, I think. And the reason I say that is that we are only at the beginning of understanding how nature does some really clever things. And we saw biofuels not work a few years ago, but to be quite honest, we were you know, way premature in our expectations. Our fundamental knowledge of how uh, bio processing, bioengineering, genetic activity, how that works, was nowhere near advanced enough. If you think forward 20, 30, 40 years, we will most definitely be doing things using advanced industrial biotechnology that we can't imagine today. Okay. Outlook for the oil and gas majors. Um, I think what we're going to see is the um, some more cycles on the price because the demand i think we're going to be in an area of peak demand particularly for oil uh, very soon if not already um, but what we're seeing is investment in supply has been depressed even faster so most likely we will see a rebound in prices and there may even be some quite good years long term however that industry is becoming you can see it in the s p it's gone from 16 percent constituents of the S&P 500, and it's now 2.3%. Maybe the right number right now would be 4% or 5%, but the glory days are over. Okay, uh, four questions to go, two minutes left. Top three financing challenges for emerging nations. For emerging nations, was that? Top three financing challenges for emerging nations, yes. Okay, I, I couldn't hear the first words that you said. I'm so sorry. No problem. My, the question is, what are the top three financing challenges ah. for emerging nations? Okay, so top three financing challenges for emerging nations. Um, I think really it's about um, credit worthiness. Um, the, the real challenge, these technologies are very cheap. They work. Um, but I think that the nations have, that have, you know, a lot of emerging nations um, have just credit worthiness challenges across the board. There's nothing nothing special about sustainability. Um, luckily, there are some techniques that you can use. I'm on the advisory group of something called Green Map, Green Map, um, which was a uh, which is now using a technique that um, that was sort of invented in Argentina because they were nationalizing assets and then very quickly flipped around to attracting. Uh, seven billion dollars of foreign investment into renewable energy, uh, and that was by uh, very clever nested uh, guarantees. So there are ways around those challenges. Okay, A three effective ways for women to secure financing. This is a very tough question. I'll tell you, I've worked on uh, inclusion of women in this sector for. Uh, over a decade, well over a decade, um, I, you know, worked on getting more women speakers at the Bloomberg NEF summits. And we got that number. It took us a while, but we got it up to 30 percent. I think it's well above that now. But where we found it really difficult was the Bloomberg uh, New Energy Pioneers, where there just weren't the women coming through as entrepreneurs, C-suite of the uh, of the startups. So I I. I'm going to be completely honest, that's a problem that I don't think anybody has cracked. We need to get women into the venture capital community because their venture capitalists fund people who look like them. So you need to get women in there. We need um, and we need more women to just start 
things and have the, the self-confidence to go out and demand the, d demand the money. Um, there are also some cultural issues around women tending not to be as uh, ambitious and uh, or, or not willing to blow their own trumpet to the same extent as men. And I've got investments in women-led businesses, and they tend to go for smaller funding rounds and build the business much more organically than the guys who go out and they say, I'm going to raise you know, 10 million, then 50 million. And the women will be saying, raise two, I'll raise four. And that may be the right answer. It may be the right answer, but we need, uh, we need all sorts of actions. That's a great topic for another, uh, another webinar or, or, or a workshop or whatever, because I'd love to know the answer. Okay, will COVID-19 narrow or widen the gender gap in sustainability? I think COVID-19, in, in some ways, it's, um, it's kind of like the whole deck of cards has been thrown on the floor and then it gets gathered up again and it can be in a different order. There are opportunities, um, so incumbents are struggling um, in, across, and it could be across healthcare or it could be across uh, technology, it could be across energy, across transport, home delivery solutions, everything is up in the air. And where there's, where there's discontinuity, there's opportunity for new players. The incumbents are being threatened, challenged, broken. And from an entrepreneur's perspective, and, for, and you know, for women coming in, they're not the incumbents, they're coming in as the attackers in these sectors. I think it has to be really good news. Uh, you know, tragic pandemic, but good news for, there must be enormous numbers of new businesses being launched as we speak. People who've been furloughed, starting businesses, um, new products, new technologies. What an opportunity. Great. Our last question, the pink recession, drive women's interest in entrepreneurship or hold them back? Uh, when you say the pink recession, what do you mean by that? I'm sorry. I'm not familiar okay. with the term. Um, okay, so that means that uh, uh, lately, we're because of the of, of uh, COVID nineteen, people have faced lead out, and they think that the lead out is more more on women than uh, men's actually. Yeah, I think I think the impact of um, the lockdowns on um, gender roles is really not yet been well understood, um, and I think they have hit women. Around the world, you know, maybe, maybe this is not, maybe not an answer so much for, for Abu Dhabi or for the Gulf region, but you know, if you look at what's happened, is children have had to be looked after from from home, and uh, everything has just become much more difficult. And I think we have seen a differential impact on on women. Um, I would like to think that it shouldn't impact entrepreneurs, partly because entrepreneurs are kind of crazy and they're going to entrepreneur anyway because that's what they do. And partly because you know that there are the, the barriers to enter and to build new businesses have never been lower. You know you can you 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 can you know get a cloud server in in minutes and so, you know you, you, there are so many tools to start your business to work remotely. I mean imagine the pandemic hitting before the internet was here, before we could do this. It would be much more uh, disruptive and terrible. So I I think. Um, there are real impacts that have differentially hit women's um, engagement in society, um, but from an entrepreneur's perspective, I'd have to think hard. I'd have to, I, you'd have to convince me that that was a, that was you know why you can't go out and be an entrepreneur and start your business and be successful. Okay, done. Uh, done with the uh, uh, questions. Um, thank you, everyone who've asked the question. Um, on that, on that note, uh, Michael, we conclude our first session in the Wiser Wisdom series. I hope you all find it engaging and enlightening. And uh, thank you so much, Michael, for giving us your time and sharing your knowledge. And thank you to everyone who joined and contributed to today's conversation. Zainab, it's my pleasure entirely. I wish you luck with the continuation of the series. And I hope uh, to be able to visit uh, and, and to see you all in person sometime hopefully in the next year if not uh, if if not then you know at least by the end of 2021 inshallah we look forward to seeing you all again at our next session stay safe everyone and goodbye